high design is often eclipsed by other stars around him. His specialty, as we all know, is producing Broadway blockbusters, the blockbusters that we've all come to know and love. Jeffrey Seller was born and raised in a suburb of Detroit, but always had his eye on New York and Broadway. In fact, he went straight there after getting a degree in political science, although he took a bunch of theater classes at the University of Michigan. Within a decade, he made his mark producing one of the most successful musicals in history and one of my personal favorites, Rent. More than a musical, it broke new ground by highlighting difficult social issues, including sexual orientation and AIDS, and spoke to a generation of young people in a, ways that, in a way that musical theater had never done, for before, done so before. Rent toured the world and made Jeffrey Seller someone to watch. Now, given the phenomenal success of the play, it would have been the capstone of most people's career, but he was just getting started. In the years that followed, he would go on to produce other successful plays, including Avenue Q and a revival of West Side Story. Another hit was written by a young Puerto Rican actor and rapper from the Columbian Heights neighborhood of Manhattan named Lynn manuel Miranda. It was called originally Washington Heights and then became known as In the Heights. As it turned out, Lynn had another idea. This one was about one of America's founding fathers. He and Jeffrey collaborated on this very unconventional concept and what resulted is far and away one of the most original and successful Broadway musicals of all time. It is, of course, Hamilton featuring a uniquely diverse cast that tells the story of early American history through hip hop and other genres. By any definition, in both subject and style, Hamilton is truly revolutionary. The story is fascinating, exhilarating, and ultimately heartbreaking. It is, as the New York Times described it, hip, sentimental, irreverent, and deeply patriotic all at the same time. In addition to its extended run in New York, it's now touring in cities across America with, it, with an extended stay here in Chicago and more recently London. It has won way too many awards to mention and it has turned Lin-Manuel Miranda into a household name. Now, producing a great musical is an enormous feat, but like many great business leaders, Jeffrey Seller is also disrupting his industry in several very valuable ways. He has used techniques to price tickets so that more people can afford them. His $20 rush tickets are last minute seats, often in the front row. They became so popular at one point that people were sleeping on the streets to get them. Now he feared for their safety and he tweaked the model and came up with a lottery based system with the same low price. He also has made sure that low-income students could go to Broadway, and they receive a special discounted rate for the Wednesday matinees. In addition, he's developed some innovative revenue-sharing models for the Hamilton actors specifically, so that they benefit from the show's stunning profits. And a year ago, if he wasn't busy enough, he launched a new production about high school drama programs, and he also has another play um, that will soon debut in Chicago about Cher. He has a lot on his plate, but I get a sense that there is a lot more to come. The Economic Club of Chicago always welcomes leaders and innovators in a wide variety of fields. Jeffrey Seller is both, and we are thrilled, really thrilled to have him with us tonight. But before he takes the stage, please join me in welcoming the following, in wa watching the following clip. Ladies and gentlemen, watch this. In uh, July of 86, I began my life in New York City. A friend of mine said, do you want to go with me tonight? I'm going to this rock monologue. And then out comes this tall, curly haired, lanky guy with big ears in Jonathan Larson. And that was the beginning of our relationship in the fall of 1990 that ultimately culminated in his creation of and my producing of Rent in 1996. So 
on Washington Heights up at the dawning. I'll wipe down the awning. Hey, y'all, good morning. Perhaps the greatest musical ever written returns to the place where it all began. What have we got? But the cranes above us soaring. The commotion and the clamor in the whelming of the steel. Patiently waiting, I'm passionately smashing Every expectation, every action's an act of creation I'm laughing in the face of casualties of sorrow For the first time I'm thinking past tomorrow And the 50th anniversary Tony Award for Best New Musical goes to... Rent. Avenue Q. In the Heights. Hamilton. Look around. Look around. How lucky we are to be alive right now. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey Selmer. Yay. This is a very cool room tonight. And I'm so, so happy to be here with you. Thank you, Donna, and the entire Economic Club of Chicago for this warm, warm welcome. Um, you know, I can't watch that clip about Rent and Jonathan Larson um, without crying a little bit because Artists come and artists go, and sometimes they go too soon. But let's get to Chicago. <laughs> I fell in love with this city as a 16-year-old cherub studying theater at Northwestern University at their <laughs> National High School Institute. That was in the summer of 1981, and it was my first time being away from home in Oak Park, Michigan, for an extended period of time. I will always remember the crystalline blue of Lake Michigan on July 4th, the cafeteria at Allison Hall, Let Us Entertain You's Fritz That's It, <laughs> where my roommate's mother took us to dinner, and many unforgettable trips to Chicago theater, including the iconic Balm and Gilead production, and my favorite musical of that time, Evita, which we saw at the Schubert Theater. It's particularly sweet that my first show, Rent, played that theater many years later, and that Hamilton is playing in the exact same theater for the last 20 months. I'm happy to be preparing my new musical, The Share Show, which is in fact going to open at the Ford Center for the Arts, also called the Oriental Theater, this June. We're going to talk mostly about Hamilton tonight, but before doing so, I want to share with you two observations about my work in the theater. First, and most important, I have loved every single piece of art that I have brought to the stage. It's a requirement for me. Commercial potential is almost impossible to judge, and unless I believe in and feel the beauty and power of the work, I don't do it. Second, I have been committed to expanding the demographics of Broadway. Rent started that trend by attracting younger people to Broadway who before that had never thought there was anything in it for them. It was furthered by Avenue Q, and of course, Lin-Manuel Miranda's In the Heights replaced the shtetl of Fiddler on the Roof with the barrio and reached the Hispanic community who celebrated seeing characters who could be their family and friends up on that Broadway stage. And now with Hamilton, high school students describe the thrill of seeing American history played out by people who look and act a lot like them. Hamilton started for me as my next musical. 
It was one of four new musicals I was developing at that time. And after Lynn shared with me the first batch of songs, I knew it was special. After our initial work sessions, I knew it was very good. And after we opened at the public theater, I knew it would be some sort of a success on Broadway. Of course, after it opened on Broadway, I knew it would be a huge success, perhaps like shows like The Book of Mormon or Wicked. But here is also what I learned over the course of our first year on Broadway. Hamilton is not a show, former chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, Rocco Landisman, told me. Hamilton is a national trust. Everyone owns it, he said. Mr. Landsman was right. Hamilton has very quickly become part of the fabric of our American culture, our American dialogue, with a diverse cast that looks like America today, it is a story that can be possessed and embraced by all Americans, young and old, female and male, and people of all backgrounds and ethnicities. Indeed, Hamilton is our own uniquely American story. Two of the many tasks of a Broadway producer are to promote the show and maximize profits for the investors. It was clear from the start, though, that my mission would need to be broader. We needed to make the show accessible to all people, regardless of their ability to pay conventional Broadway ticket prices. And, of course, we knew we needed to bring the show to students in an affordable way. That meant instituting a daily lottery that enables 46 people per night to see the show for 10 bucks, ham for ham. And along with that, Lynn's twice-weekly ham-for-ham performances outside the Richard Rogers Theater in New York enabled tens of thousands of fans and hundreds of thousands online to enjoy a little bit of the creativity and brilliance of the Hamilton cast and their many special guests, regardless of whether or not they won the lottery that night. Of course, our most important initiative has been what we affectionately call Eduham a national education program giving hundreds of thousands of high school students an opportunity to engage in an innovative curriculum about the founding era that starts in the classroom and culminates at a student performance of Hamilton. Lynn, the director Thomas Kale, and I dreamed up this program in the summer of 2015 before we played our first performance on Broadway. Our goal was to bring to Hamilton 20,000 Title I students per year for $10 each. This program started with funding from the Rockefeller Foundation and is a collaboration between the show, the Miranda family, and the Gilder Lehrman Institute for American History. And it was made possible, perhaps most crucially, by the teachers who committed to the rigorous, uh, to the rigorous, to the rigorous curriculum. The program begins in the schools with a two-month-long course led by a history teacher in which students study the American Revolution and then create their own original songs, poems, dramatic scenes, or dances inspired by their study. The students use primary sources like materials from the founding era as well as lyrics from the musical. Each participating class then submits one piece for consideration, and then 12 schools are selected to present a performance on stage the morning of the student matinee. Imagine for a second what it would be like to be a high school sophomore or junior from a school in Englewood, and then walking onto the stage of the Schubert Theater to perform for 2,000 peers. The student performances are followed by a question and answer with the cast, and then after a break for lunch, the actual show. This program started in April 2016, and since then, we have expanded it nationally, and we are now fulfilling our pledge to bring Hamilton to 250,000 high school students between 2016 and 2020. Here in Chicago, with the support of numerous generous donors, some of whom are here tonight, 
and to whom I thank fervently for their passion for this program, we have played thus far to 19,850 public high school students. Um, and nothing could have made me feel better tonight than when two of them came up to meet me most recently on the dais. And I want to point out Khalil Sims and Coyote Balagai from Urban Prep. Will you guys stand up? There we are, right here in the right side of the room. These two students are from Urban Prep and they are the pupils of um, the head of school, Tim King, who is also sitting here on the dais. And I call out to you, Tim. That's what makes it all worth it. We do this because Eduham has a powerful, positive impact on the students who participate. It may be their first time learning from a primary source, like one of the Federalist Papers, seeing a play in a theater, writing a monologue or a poem, or performing before an audience. It is a valuable tool for teaching American history and the unique and powerful role democracy plays in our individual lives. This program isn't just about teaching students to be writers or performers or activists. It's teaching young people to engage as citizens. Yes, Hamilton is a big business. And you may have read articles about the high cost and limited availability of tickets, the reselling of tickets on the secondary market, the premium prices of tickets sold by the show, and the positive and negative impact of this kind of capitalism at work. One, I think that Alexander Hamilton might be proud of that kind of capitalism. <laughs> but two, with our daily lottery that anyone can enter, and our education program, we will sell 150,000 seats this year across the country for only $10. This represents my best effort to balance capitalism with accessibility, serving the interests of the communities in which we play while reflecting the egalitarian values expressed in the musical we present. You may have read in today's Chicago Tribune that we just announced our newest initiative, Hamilton the Exhibition, a traveling museum that will open in Chicago on Northerly Island this coming November. This 300... <laughs> Thank you. This 360-degree immersive exhibition will take visitors on an exploration through the American Revolution and the founding of our country from the perspective of Alexander Hamilton. The exhibit represents our latest opportunity to entertain, educate, illuminate, and inspire. Hamilton the Musical is a brilliant work of theater. Hamilton the Exhibition will be a meticulously expressed revolutionary experience that starts at the trading post in St. Croix, where Alexander Hamilton worked as a teenager, travels with Hamilton to New York City, where he experiences the fervor of the revolutionary spirit, and lands on the hilltop of Weehawken, New Jersey, where he met his end in the tragic duel with Aaron Burr. With Lynn manuel as narrator and music from the, show's, um, from the show as underscore, this exhibit will aim to visually delight its visitors, unpack some common misperceptions about our nation's founding, teach all of us something about the revolution that we never knew, and perhaps most important, inspire us with the power of our American democracy to positively affect the lives of all its citizens. And like our show, this exhibit will be free for Title I school children on selected weekdays. The exhibition is a partnership with the Chicago Parks and Recreation Department and would not have been possible without the support of Mayor Rahm Emanuel, who I thank. Why Chicago? 
We chose to open this exhibit in Chicago because this city has been integral to Hamilton's reach and success over these past two years. And Chicago loves a great exhibition. <laughs> Chicago embodies the intersection of civic stewardship, cultural engagement, and capitalism that define American exceptionalism. The Herculean efforts of the business and civic leaders, the architects who dreamed up and built the Chicago World's Fair in, 1990, in 1893 exemplified how a city can enrich the lives of its citizens through entertainment, education, and illumination. What better place to launch a new exhibition that celebrates our American history, our values, and our impulses? I continue to be thrilled by the things we can make and build and support together. Hamilton has been a valuable teaching tool for me as a student of American history, as a Broadway producer, and as an entrepreneur. I have been delighted to apply everything I've learned over these past few years to this beautiful musical. Thank you for joining me tonight at the Economic Club of Chicago. No, I think before we even start with the questions, we get another video. Oh, are we, we're going to do the video about the education program. Right, we get one more video. This is good. So we get another video. It's about three minutes. <laughs> Hamilton is the most exciting thing that's happened in American theater and American history in a generation. It was Jeffrey Seller, the producer of Hamilton, who made the connection with Gilda Lehrman and enlisted us to produce an educational program. Through the Hamilton Education Program, over the next five years, we expect to have 250,000 inner city kids from Title I schools have a chance to experience the founding era through our curriculum that sets them up to do their own original acts and then experience the show at Hamilton. The show's producers have been working with the New York Public Schools, the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, the Gilder Lehrman Institute, to make sure that thousands of low-income students have the chance to see the show. Jeffrey was involved in every round of reviews in terms of looking at the curriculum, looking at the quality of the produced materials, looking at the impact on students. Jeffrey cared in every minute detail. Make great performance pieces, okay? What is this? I chose the event of the Boston Massacre, and then we had to find the primary sources. Like it pushed me to do some stuff to learn about history. All the things that you kids are learning in the Federalist Papers, in the Constitution, in the Declaration of Independence are um, ways of life that you are here to protect right here and right now. What's the last name was? Last name Jefferson, first name Thomas, broke these ten amendments, they were sort of like a promise. We don't have time to go over all of them, so what we gonna do is talk about a few. So listen to us um... One of the main ideas behind our rap was how about we pick a couple of rights that are being maybe like a little bit yeah, abused or like misunderstood. Not a lot of people understand the full potential of the Bill of Rights. I like the practice, but I'll be nervous when I'm in front of everybody else, but I, I should be good. favorite part about the project is pretty much everything because like it's just like <laughs> we were all friends already but I think this made us even closer so yeah. it was fun he belongs in a handful of people who are bright who are visionaries who are doers you're so young, my God.
It just gets better. There is so much I want to ask you about, but I want to go back first, then come forward. Um, I want to start with how you found this love of Broadway, because I read you were in fourth grade. <laughs> what happened? Yes, so um, I have a feeling there's going to be enough people in this room to tell this story. Um, when I was in the fourth grade, I was in a Purim play at Temple Israel in Detroit, Michigan. And here's what you need to know about the Purim plays from Temple Israel in Detroit, Michigan, which is that our very ingenious director, Eleanor Glazer, would juxtapose Purim, the story of Queen Esther, against a Broadway musical. And that year, they chose South Pacific. Um, and Queen <laughs> Esther was singing about King Ahasuerus, I'm going to wash that man right out of my hair. <laughs> Now, um, I guess they thought that the kids playing the sailors, and that was me, um, shouldn't sing There's Nothing Like a Dame. So they also brought in HMS Pinafore by Gilbert and Sullivan to sing We Sail the Ocean Blue and Our Saucy Ships of Beauty, which means that in fourth grade, I was exposed to Gilbert and Sullivan and Rodgers and Hammerstein. It was set. So that was it. That I, mean, was, I mean, were, literally. So we it did was, that. It was Temple, and you were hooked. And I was hooked. And then I walked away, and um, this was fourth grade. And I sat in my fourth grade um, public school class in the weeks thereafter. So this would have been in late March, early April. And I wrote my first. I wrote a play, and I called that play um, Adventureland. Right. Which and is that is now the name of my company. So this was fate, brought to you by religion. It seems like. Wow. <laughs> and now I'm an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> That's just not right. That is just not right. That temple brought you your version of God. That's just not right. Yeah. But if my mom were here, so alive, she would not like that. <laughs> um, and then the first play you ever saw was on, on Broadway. Yes. Dream Girls. No, and I love it. Wait, this is story is very important. This is an important story. Cousin. Uh, 17 years old. I was graduating from Oak Park High School. I'd never been to New York in my life. I dreamed about going to New York. So my cousins, Marty and Andrea Singer, that guy sitting to my right on the dais, who was um, uh, a research genius at Bell Labs, far smarter than me. So was she, right? They were both? They were both at Bell Labs. Um, they sent me a plane ticket to come to New York as my high school graduation gift. And um, on that um, Saturday in early July, uh, that's when Marty and Andrea brought me to Times Square for the first time and handed me my ticket to Dreamgirls. And that's where I saw uh, the first show I ever saw on Broadway. But this is good. It they was Dreamgirls, it was three, great. They could, not, <laughs> they could not afford three tickets. So they gave you one and you watched it by yourself? And you know what I learned? And it's good to learn this early in life, but if you haven't, I'm gonna give you a clue. It's okay and sometimes preferable to watch a play alone. <laughs> yeah. When is it preferable? You know, when you see something like Long Day's Journey into Night, which is not a happy experience, don't be with your wife. You know? <laughs> 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 Particularly if she's addicted to barbiturates. Okay, that's not a good idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, we're having an opiate crisis. That's Long Day's Journey in the Night. That was an opiate. <laughs> so you're, knew about you've that. discovered Broadway. You're that theater kid. You're yes. the theater kid. Yes. I mean, you're that kid. Totally. Like, like, totally. Like central casting theater kid, right? Yes. You know, um, Jeremy brought this up beautifully in the book about Hamilton. So, I, you know, I started doing a, a community theater shows in seventh grade. I was in the play. And very quickly thereafter, I said, who gets to pick the play? And they said, oh, well, that's the play reading committee. And very quickly after, I was the chairman of the play reading committee. <laughs> and then by eighth grade, um, I was kind of good at calligraphy when I was a, like, 13-year-old. So, so of I course. used to, you know, of course. 
the best boys are good at that shit. <laughs> <laughs> we all know how this story ends. But <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even have a glass of wine. <laughs> Anyway, um, you know, I was afraid my speech will not be funny. It will be very sincere. So now at least we get to relax. But what was I talking about? Oh, right. So then after picking the play, I start designing the flyer, and I'm designing the program, and I start writing. The, I'm a good writer, so I'm writing the press releases to send to all the local papers. And, um, and then I'm going out to all the local businesses to solicit ads right. for the programs. You know, we'll put your business card in if you give us 10 bucks. And so basically, by f age 14, I was picking the play, marketing the play, and capitalizing the play. I was a producer. So you were a producer at, as, a, as a basically a teen. Yes. But there was some drive that I haven't read a ton about, but I read some. Yes. That came from your family circumstance. You know, yes. Um, uh, my family suffered. Um, it suffered from economic decline in an era where most kids expect their family to rise. And um, it was painful. And, um, and for probably innate reasons, I was very sensitive to it. Like, I was conscious. You know, there, kids react to their environments in different ways. Some go inside themselves, some go outside themselves. But, you know, I was the kind of kid that's counting, worrying, um, being angry about my circumstances. And um, I had an enormous drive to get out. But it, it was started with an accident. I mean, it was the accident really put. Yeah. Your father had a Yeah, my father accident. was in a um, motorcycle accident when I was um, just turning five years old. Um, and the motorcycle accident um, left him with permanent brain damage and a type of dementia. And that, um, w you know, we were a family that relied on welfare in the years after. And your mom worked at McDonald's? And then my mother took a job for the first time in her life and worked at McDonald's at 12 Mile and Telegraph. And you said you felt a tr true desire and motivation to get out of that. Like you knew you were never going to live in Detroit. Yeah. You were gone. You know. Did you have to succeed? I used to sit in my backyard during college for the short time I was home before I would start going to camp to work. And I would say, how am I going to get from Oak Park to Broadway. I had no idea. I didn't need, I didn't, you know, I, I, I had never even been to New York, but I didn't even know how I would do that. Um, and, uh, and I thought, well, what will life be like if I don't do that? How would I fit in here? You know, and I knew that I could be a, I would be a great teacher and I loved teaching. Um, I could be a journalist, but I just somehow knew. And you know what, what, what's interesting about what you're talking about is many forces are converging in a young person's brain and in their heart at that time. One is my um, sexual orientation. So part of me is going, I know that this isn't me because what I am is going to, like, uh, inside of me, I think I'm going to be gay. And so I'm different. And my interests are different, um, and I do not accept my economic circumstances. So all three of those forces are all pushing me to New York City. So you get to New York, you have a job where you make $200 a week. Yeah, my first job, $205 a week, and um, um, I lived at 121 Prospect Place, and I could take out $20 a week to live on after paying the rent and paying my student loans, right? There was that. And I couldn't afford a Hebrew national salami. And that was a loss. 
And, it, <laughs> and, you know, and it took me about two years but to finally get up in the- But how did you live on $20 a week? Well, I mean, because, what you know- you, What did you eat? Well, what I would, you, you know what? I took my, I, I would take a peanut butter and jelly to, sandwich to work and cut up carrots and celery and an apple. And you do not buy anything. But you know what I would do? I would save that $20 so that I could go uh, to TKTS and um, buy that ticket to go see whatever was the latest musical on Broadway. Wow. So that's how I got to see Big River. And that's how I got to see the mystery of Edwin Drood. They weren't the greatest shows in that era. <laughs> I would ask. But they were about pretty that. good. Okay, <laughs> so let's jump to you. In ten years, you have a Tony for Rent. I mean, which is pretty remarkable. And you're standing there, and you say, "This is this remarkable time of your life." And I'm thinking to myself as I'm reading about you, how is it that you find these stories that, if someone were pitching them, they do not make sense. I mean, they really don't at a time when something like AIDS was considered a very taboo subject, you're putting it in a musical, on Broadway, bright lights, big city. You do a play about with puppets that deal with adult themes, which is a little confusing for the brain. And I went back and read some of the lyrics and they're like, <laughs> I mean, it's like presented yeah. in a cute way, but it's not. Right. The internet is for porn. <laughs> well, there's one on racism. Yeah, everyone's a little bit racist. Right. I mean, there's a lot there. And then someone comes and says, I'm going to do a play about a founding father. I mean, Snorer is your first <laughs> thought, right? A treasury secretary. I mean, I, I mean, we know Alexander Hamilton because yeah. of treasury and Wall Street yeah. and all that he did, but yes. I mean, the average person is not like, yay. Right. So um, what is it about you that could see the jewels there and what they could be? Well, here's the truth. I can't see how they're going to go over, but I can feel what they're doing inside of me. And I only go by how it feels to me. And um, if we go back to the beginning, when I met Jonathan Larson, it was, um, it was the fall of 1990. I was 25 years old. I'd broken up from my boyfriend of six years. I was in a job I did not like. And uh, a friend of mine said, hey, I'm going to see this rock monologue tonight. You want to go with me? Uh, it's called Boho Days. And uh, we went to this teeny tiny performance space, brick wall in the back. Piano, band, out comes uh, that beautiful lanky guy that you saw for just a second on that video. And he starts singing what it's like to be a 29-year-old composer of rock musicals that nobody wants to see, that nobody will produce. What it's like to be wondering, should I still keep working at this diner that I don't like? Or should I go take this job at an advertising agency on Madison Avenue that will pay me a proper salary? Should I stay with my girlfriend with whom I'm safe, but who I know is not the love of my life? And he's asking all those questions on the precipice of his 30th year. And he's asking those questions in a musical vernacular that's making the hair on my arms stand up, that's, that's making me gush with tears because I'm going, how is this guy who I've never seen before in my life telling my story? And um, I wrote him a letter the next day because, um, you know, I went to the party after, but I was shy, so I didn't really talk you to him that were much. Shy. I'm telling you, this is an act. <laughs> um, and I said to him, I, so I wrote a letter. I said, I want to produce your musicals. So help me God, the next part of this story is going to sound weird, but it's true. So two weeks later, I'm, uh, it's lunchtime at that job I said I don't like. And um, at uh, lunch, I'm eating my lunch at the desk. It is the carrots, the celery, the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and the apple. And, um, and I get called into the conference room by my boss. And uh, I go into the conference room, we sit down, and she says, you don't like this, this is not your job, and today is your last day, here's your check for two weeks, and you can pack up your things and leave. 
That's how they did it. And, uh, and, and then um, an all call came on that old fashioned intercom system, which was that if someone calls you at your desk and you're not there, then the receptionist just calls all over the office. And I heard on the intercom, Jeffrey, Jonathan Larson on line six. I went to drinks with Jonathan Larson the next day. And um, that was 1990 and rent opened in 1996. That's a great story. So do you view being fired as a favor? Yes, 100%. Did you become friends with her? You know what? Um, she still works in the business, and I hug her, and I thank her for what she taught me and for helping push me on my way. And Jonathan never really saw how successful Rent was. Jonathan died two hours after the final dress rehearsal of Rent at New York Theatre Workshop on January 25th, 1996. Did you feel like you owed him everything you had to make that successful because of I that? still feel like I owe him everything now. I'm sure he knows it. Yeah. So you discover not only Jonathan, one after another, they come to you, or do you find them? Well, you know, with Avenue Q, um, another friend of mine said there's a workshop of this um, burgeoning TV show that was happening at a church. Uh, it was the church underneath the City Corps building. Funny, the first person who ever took me to the City Corps building was Marty on that same day I saw Dreamgirls. So now I'm going to the church, and uh, there's these young composers, uh, Jeff Marks and Bobby Lopez, and they want to make a TV show that is loosely inspired by and parodies Sesame Street with these puppets. And I'm, uh, I'm watching on stage as these puppets are singing, if you were gay, that'd be okay, but hey, I'd like you anyway. <laughs> and then another one singing, everyone's a little bit racist, and then another one singing, the internet is for porn. I fell off my chair laughing. I had never seen anything like that before. And, um, and when that performance was over, I, had, I, I wasn't as shy, and I saw Bobby and Jeff, and Jeff had gone to Michigan, and they were happy to meet me, and I said, well, good luck with your TV show, and if it doesn't work out and you want to make a musical, give me a call. They called me. <laughs> and, uh, and then we did that show. And, uh, you know, Every show I, have, I do has to surprise me in some way. And, you know, if you think back to Rent, and uh, when I was at what became, you know, the second workshop of Rent, there's that moment that Mimi enters the stage for the first time and knocks on Roger's door, and that begins Light My Candle. And you have never seen someone sing like that. You have never seen a duet play out like that, that can both develop two characters, further a story, and be in that musical world that is so powerful. And I knew that's when we have to do Rent. And with Avenue Q, when you hear everyone's a little bit racist, and you hear it coming out of the mouth of a puppet, I knew <laughs> we're going to do that show. Why is Hamilton a hit? Why is it this cultural phenomenon? Why? Um, now it's all Monday morning quarterbacking, right? It's the best kind of Monday morning quarterbacking because we're asking how did it win the Super Bowl? Um, and I think that, well, first of all, I want to say, I think everybody has an answer, and I think they're all right. Um, and you know, quite frankly, when we started developing it, I thought this is going to be, this is really good and it is going to be some kind of a success. But it was going to be a concept album initially? Well, that's true too. You know, when Lynn started, I was like, you're doing great work, keep going. He didn't want to make a musical. He wanted to make a batch of songs in which he would not have to be enslaved to the structure of a Broadway musical. So he just wanted to flex all of his hip hop muscles. So we all said, great. Now, it was his collaborator and sneaky director Thomas Kael who persuaded him to go from three songs in three years to, 12, to adding nine songs over the next nine months. Because Tommy had a, a, a little plan, which is if I can get him to write one song a month and then we string them together in a little concert, which we did at Lincoln Center, 
then we'll find out if we have a musical. And um, that is exactly what happened for once um, Lynn had written about 10 songs and we put them together, we did that, they did that evening and I said, well, you got a musical. And they both said, yes, we have a musical. And we were off to the races with what was called Hamilton, the mixtape. Which you did not like that name. You know what? Um, I, I think Hamilton is divine. And I'm saying that literally. You know how everyone says literally these days? My 13 year old says literally all the time. But um, you know, I feel like, like Lynn was channeling this God that your mother believes in. <laughs> and I do when it fits the story. And um, Lynn was channeling God, and I think Hamilton was divine. And um, uh, you know, it's like you don't even know where it comes from. And uh, I think Hamilton does something for us. I think it reinvigorates a sense of American patriotism inside of all of us that um, reminds us what it means to be American and how lucky all of us are to be born in or be able to immigrate to this great country and achieve our goals. There's one spot I want to go so badly, but I don't think I'm going to do it. No, you can. You, I told you you could do anything, it's just, it's, Melody. So then when, when you have someone at that point running for office saying overrated two bit, you know, this, that, and the other, and attacking immigrants. Yes. Which I know one of the lines in the play, immigrants, we get the job done, gets yes. big applause in yes. the theater. And you're talking about American patriotism. Yes. There's like something's incongruous here with, with our society today. <coughs> Does that make it more important and therefore more successful, do you think? Um, you know what was interesting? Um, when uh, Hamilton came along and um, President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama were uh, of our greatest fans, it felt like the Obama era musical and it felt like the timing was so fantastic that during this golden era, this golden administration, um, we also had this musical and it just felt like, wow, we're so lucky all this converged at the same time. And um, after the, um, uh, I, I don't even know what to call it, but I know for us at Hamilton, it was a trauma of the election of 2016. It quickly became apparent to us that now Hamilton is even more important than ever. So what did it feel like when you had When you had the Pence incident and the stage and the speech, how did you feel about that? Uh, proud. And the tweets? Yeah. Um, here's what happened. Uh, did you know what was going to happen? Yeah, I'm going to tell you. Okay. Um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> I do that sometimes. I'm I sorry. love you. Sorry. No. I, I, I try know, to I'm hold just like, my I, I'm just like wondering how far I'm going to go because, you know, we really want I've already to go talked there. about opiates, Eugene O'Neill, and barbiturates. But um, here's what happened. You know, the, the day after that election was a Wednesday, and we had to do a matinee and an evening show. And um, we on Broadway, and particularly us at Hamilton, we had a cast we had to pick up off the floor. I had cast members who said, I now fear, I now feel ashamed. I don't know how to go to work today because I feel displaced. And we went to work. We went to new work in New York. And of course, my cast members who are here, we went to work in Chicago. And um, about a week and a half later, maybe two, it was a week and a half later, um, it was a Friday. I actually took off early that day. I was going to go see a movie with my partner, Josh. Um, we were going to go see Manchester by the Sea at Lincoln Plaza. And I leave the office. Light? Yeah, light movie. That's what I go do on a Friday for fun. <laughs> <laughs> I like serious stuff. Anyway, um, so I'm, I'm getting ready. I'm, leave, like, I'm walking to the movie from the subway. Phone rings. Uh, it's uh, my COO, Maggie. And she's like, Jeffrey, I have to tell you something. I was like, what? I'm going to the movies. 
They just called me and uh, Vice, what's his name, Pence, he wasn't pr Vice President yet. So he would be Vice President-elect Pence uh, called and asked to buy tickets for Hamilton tonight. And I went, oh, fuck. <laughs> oh, no. huh. I, I want the boys at the academy to forgive me, please. <laughs> so, um, you know, because I, I didn't want to deal with that. Like, do I say yes? Do I say no? We have to be respectful. He's asking for right. house seats. He's asking to buy them. Of course we're going to sell them to him. I'm not going to say, oh, we're sold out. <laughs> you know, here's the other secret. There's always two more seats. <laughs> They might be 850 bucks, but there's two more seats. Uh, anyway, so I say, sell them the tickets. And then I get to the movie theater, and I say to Josh, just go in. I, I have to do something. And I literally got out my iPhone, and I started writing a speech. And uh, it was largely a speech that you heard that night. And it I wrote that. You? Uh, yes. And I wrote that speech, and I got Tommy on the phone. And I said, so um, uh, Pence is coming tonight. He said, oh, shit. And he said, let's get Lynn on the phone. Lynn was in London making Mary Poppins. And uh, luckily, we got Lynn on the phone. And I said, I know we're not going to do this, guys, but I wrote this. And of course, it was twice as long and more uh, vitriolic. And, um, and uh, I read it to both of them. And Tommy goes, I think we have to do this. And Lynn said, let's go. And I said to Josh, bye, enjoy the movie. And I went straight to the office, and we gathered together um, our team of production stage managers, um, and we started to talk about, should we do this? Should we give a speech? Is it appropriate? And um, where we landed is, this is not normal. What just happened is not normal, and therefore, we are going to do this. So uh, we then... Uh, we then uh, brought together the entire company in New York, and we met, and we made this proposition to them. Um, and I called um, my colleague and friend, Brandon Victor Dixon, who was playing Aaron Burr, and I asked him if he would read that speech that at that point had been um, edited, rewritten by Lynn and Tommy and I. And, uh, and Brandon said yes, and the cast said let's go, and we made a decision that we would do it immediately following the performance, um, knowing that he may very well leave before we get to do it. But in fact, um, Brandon was able to get it out before the uh, vice president-elect left, and to his credit, he was um, gracious, he stayed, he listened to that speech, and um, it helped us. It helped us stand up for what this show stands for, and it helped us stand up for what is right. Were you standing up? <laughs> but I hear also this gay man standing up for himself, right? I mean, you yes. wrote it. Yes. Was that, was that you standing up for yourself? I was standing up for me. I was standing up as a gay father for my son who had to ask me the morning after the election, did he win? Wincing. I was standing up for our Mexican actors, our African-American actors, our gay actors, our women. We were standing up for all of us who had been reviled by that man. So tell me something. I think it's clear how you feel. <laughs> um, and I, but I want to take that thread to something else you feel strongly about, which yes. is you want an inclusive and accessible Broadway for yes. everyone. This yes. is very important to you. Why is this so important to you? Not just ticket prices, but you want the audience to be inclusive. You, Broadway is not known as being known for being diverse, it yes. just isn't. And it has a long way to go to get there. So why is this your issue? 
You know, when we were doing Rent Off-Broadway, and I realized, standing in the back of the New York Theatre Workshop, that this is a show, this show is who I am. And I thought, if I can't do this show on Broadway, then I guess I'm not going to be able to work on Broadway, because this is me. And these are my people. And, and, and by that, I mean the lesbian couple and the gay couple and the Latina and the young African-American and the straight couple. And if this- Why did you feel they were you, all of them? Why? Because why I guess I always felt like an outsider. Because I was a gay kid growing up in Detroit. And so then you want them to also experience, the, have the theater experience as well? So I want an inclusive society in which all of us get to participate. All of us get to play. But it's interesting. Because if you just put all white people in a room, it's really boring. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Do you know how I spend my day? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, wow, I lost my train of thought on that one. <laughs> but this is what I think is fascinating about you. So you've had this desire to make sure that you've created these very, very unique experiences. They've become these giant, giant hits. You've brought in people that haven't been there before. Do you think that is the future of Broadway? The other thing I found interesting is that you never wanted to tag, and this is what I read, so it might not be true. Yeah. You didn't want to tag Hamilton as a hip hop musical. That's what I read. Sure, because Hamilton is so many things. It is um, an R&B musical. It is a traditional musical. Um, it is many things. So it wasn't about that. It was just more that it's lots of genres. Absolutely. But then when you go back to this idea of this inclusiveness, is that when you look and see what is coming, right. so do you think that diverse audience goes to see Cher? Um, well, we're going to find out. Um, <laughs> first, we're going to have to see if an audience goes to see Cher. <laughs> you know, I mean, I gotta tell I don't know, you, I've been doing this good. a long time, and we don't count our chickens anymore <laughs> until they're hatched. How do you um, know? If, what, what do you feel like when it doesn't work? Crushed. Um, I, first, I feel like I have failed my company, who I have to show up to talk to on the night that I tell them that their show is closing on Sunday. And that's an awful feeling, because I have failed them. And something very concrete is about to happen, which is that on Monday, they will be out of a job. But have you failed them, or did the creative person fail them? Well, because if, you're not the creative person. Well, and the answer is, blame whoever you want. We have all failed to sustain this enterprise. And um, you know, on Broadway, we measure success with dollars. Right. Um, in the Resident regional theaters, that is not the measure of success because the donors help to support the theater so that they don't have to be measured by that success. But at the end of the day, if one wants to play in the arena of Broadway, one has to play with the idea that if your weekly expenses are greater than your weekly income, you are soon going to close. And that is a failure. Blame whoever you want. But if I'm the producer, I'm going to blame myself. So you feel a great deal of responsibility. Yes. And, and, and you know what? And it, and it is always that way. And I'll give you an example. Um, in the same time that I was working on Hamilton, I was working with Sting on The Last Ship, which many of you know opened here in Chicago four years ago. And um, that was a labor of love. I worked with Sting for four years. He is a consummate artist. He is a mensch. Um, I loved him. And, and um, when that show failed on Broadway, it hurt. And, um, and it still stays with me. And I still spend 
mind time asking myself, what could I do to fix it? What could I do to change the outcome? I want to do a really quick speed round. We're so out of time, but okay. I just have to ask a few questions. Right. Your favorite Broadway play of all time. A chorus line. The most underrated Broadway play you ever saw. Underrated. Like, it's so much better than what people think. Maybe oh, it didn't make gosh. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Wild Party by Andrew Lippa, which I worked on. The most overrated Broadway play you ever saw. Forget it. Not on your life. You're not going Next. to say it. You've said everything else. Yeah. <laughs> How many times you've seen Hamilton? Oh my God. Well, if you say to yourself, I see it, I mean, I could see it four times in one week. I don't know, I've probably seen it a hundred times. Only a hundred. And, and now I will admit, sometimes I walk out and get a coffee and come back right in the middle of that too. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell Miguel. <laughs> if you could bring back a musical and revive it, have a revival, what would Yeah, I've always said I won't do revivals. And then I did West Side Story. Um, because when someone like the author of West Side Story, Arthur Lawrence, says, will you do West Side Story? You say, yes, I would like to do West Side Story. Um, and you know what? That did it for me because there is no better show than West Side Story. So you wouldn't do another one? No. And the best... Which means for sure I will because, you know, we contradict ourselves. And after the tremendous, phenomenal, hard-to-even-quantify success that you've had, what do you hope for next? Do you know what I hope? I hope to walk into a little performance space with a brick wall and maybe just a piano and have that exact same feeling I felt when I saw Jonathan Larson do Boho Days in 1990. That's what I'm chasing. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey Seller. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>